Picture this. You have a small network with one switch and a few devices connected. Perhaps some workstations, printers, and a router connected to the internet. As the business grows, you need to add more equipment, so you add a second switch. This is, of course, connected to the first switch. This is all still one single VLAN and one subnet at this point. We're just increasing the number of available ports. Now let's say we grow a bit more and add a third switch. Of course, we'll want to link this to our other two switches. This is still all one VLAN and one subnet, just extra ports that we can use. It might not be obvious, but this presents us with a problem. Consider what happens when a device on the network sends a frame to the switch. You'll remember from earlier videos that switches learn MAC addresses of connected devices, so it knows exactly where to send these frames. Broadcasts, however, are a bit different. They are sent out all switch ports on the VLAN, except the port the frame was received on. This includes links to other switches. Do you see the problem that we might face here? Take a look at what happens to the broadcast frame. The switch forwards the frame out of each port, including the uplinks to the other switches. These switches forward the frame out their ports too. The broadcast frame begins looping around the network indefinitely. Remember that frames operate at layer 2, not layer 3 like packets do. There's nothing built in at layer 2 to stop frames from looping around. But surely that's not too bad, right? A frame loops around for a bit, it can't be that bad. Look what happens when we add a fourth switch. This causes a single broadcast frame to be duplicated many times, each one looping around indefinitely. What if we now add more hosts to the network? Even with just four hosts, this is getting out of control. Of course, with four switches, we could have a hundred hosts, and a four switch network isn't even all that big. We call this a broadcast storm. These frames will continue to loop and duplicate until the switches can't handle any more traffic. At this point, the network grinds to a halt. It's a pretty big problem now, isn't it? This is where spanning tree protocol comes in. This is a relatively old protocol developed by Radia Perlman in 1985. It is a process that runs on every switch, detects potential loops, and strategically disables certain links, making the network loop free. But you may be wondering, why bother cabling up these extra links if spanning tree is just going to block them anyway? Well, there are two reasons. Firstly, spanning tree is clever enough to select the most appropriate link to block, which might not be the one you are expecting. Second, if we lose one of our switches or other links, spanning tree can re-enable the blocked link, repairing the network. The key points to remember right now are, spanning tree works at layer two. Layer two does not have any built-in loop prevention. Layer three does have loop prevention, this is the time to live field in the IP header. Here you can see the benefit to really understanding the lower levels of the OSI model. This doesn't seem too hard so far, right? But this has been a simple topology. A complicated topology is where spanning tree really earns its money. Have a look at this network, which to be fair, isn't really overly complicated. Here we see several loops. Once again, spanning tree goes through the topology and finds the loops. It will then select the most appropriate link to disable, eliminating the loop. The most appropriate link is usually the slowest link. Spanning tree prevents layer 2 loops in our network. It does this by finding potential loops and then blocking one of the links to stop the loop from forming. Let's see how it does this. To start with, spanning tree running on one switch needs to discover other connected switches and share information with them. It will send out a special frame called a Bridge Protocol Data Unit, or BPDU. There are two types of BPDUs. This one is called a Configuration BPDU. Initially, these messages enable switches to learn if there are any other spanning tree enabled switches nearby. Did you notice that we started with a single switch and worked our way out from there? In a spanning tree topology, one switch is nominated to be the root bridge. Spanning tree is better thought of, as the name suggests, a tree shape, or maybe an inverted tree shape. At the very top of this tree is the root bridge. Let's focus our attention on the root bridge for now. The root bridge will send configuration BPTUs outward to other switches. These are sent out on all ports by default. Other switches may send BPTUs to the root bridge too, 
This depends on the version, which we'll discuss briefly later. The root bridge assigns roles to its ports that connect to other switches. Ports that face away from the root bridge are called designated ports. Other switches have some ports facing toward the root bridge and some ports facing away. One port on each switch, the one closest to the root bridge, is called the root port. The root bridge can't have ports facing itself, so it never has any root ports. Ports facing away from the root bridge are the designated ports. Ah, but wait, a loop has formed in the network. The spanning tree needs to do something about this. First, it needs to detect this loop. But how? Let's take a step back. When a switch sends a BPDU, it will put a bridge ID in there. This ID is unique to each switch. So imagine now that the root bridge is sending configuration BPDUs to its connected switches. In our example so far, there's two of them. They receive these BPDUs and know they're connected to the root bridge. As part of the spanning tree process, they also forward these BPDUs onto other switches. So in our example, these two switches will forward these BPDUs to each other. Now they will independently be able to see that they have two paths to the root bridge. There should only be one, so this is how they know that there's a loop. It is at this point that each switch needs to decide which ports are root ports. Remember that each switch makes its own independent decisions based on what it has learned. As we have said a few times, the root bridge doesn't have any root ports, so that part's easy. It makes all of its ports designated ports. It's a little bit more complicated for the other switches. Each port has a cost, which is based on the speed of the link. The higher the link speed, the lower the cost. So for now, let's say that the cost of each of these ports is 4. That's not very helpful yet, as they're all the same. The useful part is that the switch measures the total cost to reach the root bridge. Think about the root bridge sending BPDUs again. The two switches receive the BPDU and decide that the cost to get to the root bridge over these links is 4. These switches update the BPDU with the cost of 4 and send them out the other interfaces. So when these BPDUs are received, the switch adds the cost written in the BPDU message to the cost of the interface it was received on. In this example, the cost to get to the root bridge using these paths is 8. The best path to the root bridge is now clear. These ports become the root ports. It's also clear which link should be disabled to prevent this loop. But how is it done? Do both these switches disable their ports, or does just one of them do it? The short answer is, only one end of the link will be disabled, and the end that's selected comes down to the bridge ID once again. The one with the lowest bridge ID will set its port to designated. The other will set its port in a blocking state. These three switches have now fully converged and can forward traffic without the risk of looping and broadcast storms. Of course, this process needs to happen throughout the entire network, which can get more complicated as we move through. Does it end here? No, the root bridge will continue to send BPDUs out regularly. The other switches will continue to update the cost and forward them out. This mechanism is like a heartbeat. It tells the switches that they have a valid path through to the root bridge. If the BPDUs suddenly go missing, then there is probably a dead switch or link somewhere. But what happens if a switch dies? Firstly, it won't be forwarding BPDUs anymore. Nearby switches will notice the loss of BPDUs and know that the switch is gone. The spanning tree topology then goes through a reconvergence process. Switches may need to update their port types. But there are other changes that can happen in a network. We might add a new switch or link. This would also cause reconvergence and the port types could change again. Basically, anything that causes a spanning tree port to go up or down, or change the flow of BPDUs, will cause reconvergence. The next step is to think about how the rest of the network learns about these changes. This does not just rely on the configuration BPDUs that the root bridge sends. There is a second type of BPDU called a Topology Change Notification, or TCN. These are sent by regular switches, not the root bridge. TCNs are sent only when there's a change in the topology. If a switch receives a TCN, it will generate its own TCN and forward it on. Eventually this filters through to the root bridge. 
At this point, the root bridge will update its configuration BPDUs if necessary. These continue to be sent out regularly as normal. The process of flooding BPDUs, finding loops, and selecting ports is not instant. You might be wondering then, how does spanning tree prevent loops before this process has completed? Well, by default, every port on a switch goes through a particular process before it fully comes up. This lets the switch decide if any given port is connected to an end device, like a printer or workstation, or if it's connected to another switch. A loop can't form on a port connected to an end device, but it can on a switch to switch link. So when the port first comes up, probably because we've enabled it or plugged something in, it will start in the blocking state. This stops the loops from forming right away as no data can pass. The only exception to this is BPDUs, which are allowed to flow. By default, the port will remain in this state for 20 seconds. Next, the port moves into the listening state. A port in the listening state can be a root or designated port. While in this state, the switch will process any BPDUs it receives in order to learn about the network. This may cause the port to transition back to blocking if needed. Regular data still does not pass through this port yet. The listening state lasts for 15 seconds. Keep in mind that this is happening for all ports, not just ports connected to other switches. After the listening state, the port moves to the learning state. During this state, the switch does what all switches do all the time. It learns MAC addresses and builds the MAC address table. This state lasts for 15 seconds, and still regular data cannot pass through this port. Finally, the port transitions to the forwarding state and regular data can now flow. The port will remain in this state until some topology change requires it to go through the process again. As I said in the last video, spanning tree has been around for a long time, at least in IT. Years. Everything we've been discussing so far is the original spanning tree standard also called 802.1D or Classic Spanning Tree. But there's a few downsides to Classic Spanning Tree. We saw one just a moment ago when we realized that it took 50 seconds for the port to come up. So to address this and a few other issues, some newer versions of Spanning Tree were developed. We're going to take a brief look at these improvements. First up, Cisco released per VLAN Spanning Tree as a proprietary solution. Classic Spanning Tree will block links for all VLANs at once, but PVST treats VLANs individually. This means that, for example, one link may be blocked for VLAN 1, but a different link will be blocked for VLAN 2. This means that the network can be used a bit more efficiently, as you don't have entire links sitting around idle. Later, they updated this to PVST+, so it could be compatible with Classic Spanning Tree and therefore with other vendors. They also added some enhancements that would treat end device ports differently to ports that connect to other switches. So you wouldn't have to wait 50 seconds for your workstation or printer to come online. The next standard to come along was Rapid Spanning Tree or 802.1W. This was standards based so all vendors could use it. This standard still treats all VLANs the same like Classic Spanning Tree does, but it changes the way the port states work as well as their timers. It no longer takes 50 seconds to bring switch to switch links up. Cisco liked these changes, but they also liked the idea of treating VLANs individually. So they created another of their own standard. If you hadn't noticed, Cisco are kind of known for doing that. So they released rapid per VLAN spanning tree. All the advantages of RSTP and PVST in one protocol. Once again though, this is Cisco only, so other vendors can't use it. And finally, the rest of the industry caught up and created Multiple Spanning Tree, or 802.1S. MST is quick, like RSTP, but it handles VLANs better. In fact, it handles VLANs a little better than PVST and RPVST, as it considers groups of VLANs, when creating spanning tree topologies, rather than considering each VLAN individually. This approach puts less strain on the switch and its resources. 